What up folks, Alex here, Mr. Alex Tech, and in this video we're solving some DaVinci Resolve edit page mysteries. 10 random little things which can cause you huge amounts of frustration if you can't figure out what's going on, but are actually really simple to resolve once you know how. And we're going to start off with my number one tip, transitions, and why sometimes they don't quite work. So here we are within DaVinci Resolve, we're on the edit tab, I've got these two clips set up on my timeline. Now if I was to grab a video transition out of my effects library, drop it on there, uh-oh, it won't let me drop them on. Now why is it? What's going on? Why won't this work? It's actually really, really simple. This is the end of this clip and the very beginning of this clip. What DaVinci Resolve needs is a little bit of overlap in order to create the transition. It needs this. So if the edit point was right here, that would be absolutely fine. But as there's no additional footage, there's no overlap, it can't create the transition. So what we need to do is to trim these back. Now there's a bunch of different ways that you can do it. You could do a control and B just to cut these and then hit delete to ripple delete them. Or you could roll them. So I'm going to hit T on my keyboard to activate this, which is the trim edit mode. I can then just click on this clip roll it forward to create a little overlap and roll this one backwards to create an overlap and then I can drop this blur dissolve on there like so. You just need to make sure there's a bit of an overlap and then the transitions will fall on, no issues whatsoever. Now my tip number two, changing the timeline frame rate. Once you've set a frame rate to a timeline within DaVinci Resolve, there's no going back, you can't change the frame rate of that timeline. But there's a quick trick that you can do to create a new timeline with a different frame rate. So if I just hit play, you can see here at the top, I'm running at 25 frames per second. If I was just to open my project settings, the master settings, that's set to 25 frames per second. So this is a 25 frames per second timeline. Because I've got footage on it, I can't change it. So what do you do? Well, all you need to do in the media pool, right click, timelines, create new timeline, or alternatively, you can use the keyboard shortcut of Control and N. So I'm gonna hit Control and N, and it says timeline name. I'm going to call this one 60 FPS. And then just down here, we've got a use project settings. Untick that, and then you can click on the format tab, and then you can change this timeline frame rate. So I'm going to set this to 60. We're going to click create. And now within the media pool, we've got a 60 frames per second timeline. We've got our original 25 frames per second timeline, and now we've got this 60 frames one. Now above your preview window, you've also got this little drop down. This is a nice easy way to switch between the two. So I'm gonna to go to my original timeline. I'm gonna copy everything. In my case, it's just these two clips, but you just copy the entire timeline. You can click and drag, or you can just hit Control and A to select everything. We do a Control and C to copy. We're then gonna to go to a 60 FPS timeline. We're gonna just click on a timeline, make sure it's selected your playhead somewhere down there, and then Control and V, and it'll paste that footage in there like so. And now if we hit play, you can see we're running at 60 frames per second. If I was to go to deliver, you can see the frame rate is 60 frames per second. So this is a 60 frames per second timeline, and you're good to go. Now, quick warning, if we open the project settings, the timeline frame rate here will still show 25, because this is the master settings. So that can't be changed, it's still 25, but don't fear, this timeline you've just created is 60 frames per second. Number three, single viewer mode. This is an odd one, it's tripped me up a load of times in the past, it's really quick to let me show you. As you can see here, I've got this single viewer in the middle of the single viewer preview right in the middle of the screen. Now I want to activate the two preview window, so then I can maybe do a multicam or view some of my media pool, that sort of thing. Usually there's an icon up here, but it's not there, which is very strange. If I was to click on workspace and try and untick this single viewer mode, it's grayed out for some reason. So why is that? It's really simple. It's because I've got the inspector open. If I was just to close the inspector, you can now see I've got this icon, which I can click to get my two preview windows and I can hop between single viewer and twin viewer modes. If we go into workspace, this is now not grayed out and I can just tick or untick to change my viewer mode. See, told you, really quick, but can cause you loads of frustration. Number four, the retime curve dropdown and the scale. This is another strange one. So if you have a look at my timeline here, I'm gonna right click on a clip, I'm gonna to go to the retime curve, and usually there's a little drop down here, which allows me to select what I'm looking at, and it's not there. Why is that? Well, you just need to zoom in. As soon as you zoom in a certain amount, you can see the drop down, which I can then click, 
and then change. Now there's another oddity with this one. If I click the drop down, I'm gonna change this to read time speed. And I'm just gonna add a couple of keyframes just by holding Alt and clicking. And then let's just drag this section up. And I've dragged it up loads to the point where we can no longer see the line. If you hover your mouse over this percentage over on the right, you can see your cursor changes. Click, drag to the left and to the right, and you can change the scale. So now I'm at 675%, I can see my line again, and I can keep going. Number five, photos imported as a sequence. If you've got a bunch of photos that you've exported from your camera and they're in a sequential order, one, two, three, four, five, etc., it can cause you a few issues. So I'm gonna jump into my media tab and I'm gonna to go to this folder, which I prepared earlier. This is a bunch of photos, but as you can see, it's just showing as one individual thing. Click on this little three dots, this little icon here, and then click show individual frames. And that will change that from being one compacted clip to all the individual images, which you can then click import as individual images, and then you're good to go. Number six, the time code. This is not a biggie, but if it's annoying you, it's really easy to change. In the edit tab, if you go to the media pool, so I'm just gonna to go to this 60 frames per second timeline we created earlier, right click, timelines, starting time code, and you can see it's got the one there. I could just change that to a zero, click on okay, and now my actual beginning of the timeline is set to all zeros. If you want to change this for every future project, click on the word DaVinci Resolve top left, go to preferences, select the user tab at the top, come down to the editing on the left and you've got start time code. You could just change this to all the zeros and then whenever you open a project in the future, it will always start at the zeros rather than the one. Onto my next tip, which is kind of a bonus tip, but we're still in the same position. So from this screen here, from this user preferences editing tab, if you come down, you've got this general settings, really useful, you can change the standard generator duration. So generators are things like adjustment clips. So by default, mine will be two seconds. I can make them five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever. Standard duration, I can have it as one second or I could have it as 20 frames. We've got the standard still duration. Now, another really useful one, if you scroll down a little bit further, you've got this always highlight current clip in the media pool. By default, that's unticked. I like to have it ticked. So if you give that a tick and click save, and then whenever you click on a piece of footage on your timeline, it will automatically be highlighted within your media pool. Number seven, changing the volume or adding audio effects to an entire track. This isn't really a hiccup. It could cause you problems if you did it by accident, but it's just super useful to know. So I figured I'd put it in there. If I go to this audio track here on my timeline, if I give it a click, not on the timeline here, but on this little area on the left, open up the inspector, I can click on the audio tab and I've got track level. I can change the volume for this entire track in one go. Now the exact same thing works for audio effects. So a good example of this is something like noise reduction. You may drop that onto your talking or your voice channel, or you just wanna have a bit of fun. Let's go down to pitch. We'll put the pitch onto my music. We'll mess around, we'll drag the semitones down. And then if you're doing a silly gaming video, any memes, you can automatically drag things that you want to sound a bit different onto that track and you're good to go rather than having to apply the effect every time. Tip number eight, I think, am I on eight? Tip number eight, ins and outs and how to clear your ins and outs. Again, this one's caught me out before and I've seen people ask this question. So on the timeline, if you use the I and the O keys, you can mark in and out points like so. Now, if you've done that accidentally, if I was to go to the deliver tab and I was to render this out, it wouldn't render the entire timeline. You can see this bit here is grayed out. It would just render the bits that are within my I and my O, within my in and out. Now, there's two ways to clear it. My preferred method is either on the edit page or on the deliver page, just hit the alt key and X and you'll get rid of that in and out. Alternatively, let me just mark some more. We'll go to deliver. Above your little timeline in the deliver page, you've got render in and out range. You can just change that to the entire timeline and it will just mark the entire timeline so then it's good to go. Number nine, stop and go to last position. Again, this one, really annoying if you've done it by accident and you can't figure out why. And also really useful if you want to actually do it. 
So we're back on the edit page now. And if I just come under my preview window here, we've got all of our play controls. And what you may have not noticed before is if you hover your mouse over the stop button, this square in the middle, there's a little accent in the bottom right. And that's because you can right click on this and then you get this, stop and go to last position. I've put my playhead at the beginning here, I'll play. And then as soon as I hit space again to stop, it'll go to the position where it started from. So as I say, this is really annoying if you've done it by accident, but really useful. If you've got a complicated little edit that you're putting together, you just wanna watch it, go back to the beginning, make some tweaks, watch it again, turn this on. It's just a nice, simple way of being able to re-watch a particular section over and over and over again without having to move your playhead back into its original position. And last but not least, number 10, the dim position. I'm not talking about you or me. There's a button on the edit page called dim and it automatically lowers your volume. Again, really weird if you've hit it by accident and haven't noticed and you don't know why your volume is really low, but also really useful. If someone's coming to the room while you're editing, you want to show them the edit, but also just lower the volume a little bit so you can actually have a conversation as you do, there's a button just for that. So on the edit page, we've got the timeline here. Over to the right, we've got the volume. So of course you can just click on this to mute or you could manually lower the volume, but there's this little button over the right called dim. And if you hit that, it automatically lowers the volume. The volume slider will change color to be orange. That's just as another indication that it's done exactly that. So if we just play this piece of music, you can hear it's pretty loud, but if I hit the dim button, it just drastically lowers the volume. And it's just a real nice way of being able to lower the volume so you can have a conversation it's not interrupting. But again, really annoying if you hit it by accident and you didn't know you'd done it. So there you go. That's my list of 10 weird oddities that can cause you loads of trouble in DaVinci Resolve if you don't know how to fix them. Hopefully you found this video useful. If you did, give me a thumbs up. Any thoughts or feedback, please do leave them in the comment section below. And if you're new here, you enjoyed the video, maybe consider hitting that subscribe button for me. Thanks ever so much for watching. Take it easy. I'll catch you next time. See ya.